Good morning. This is Judy Burrell, and this is the Community Roundtable, and now we're sitting in a wonderful, long, elegant conference table, and I'm talking with Karen Lumpke, and Karen is one of the founders of the San Luis Valley Local Food Coalition. So Karen, tell me, how did this start? What happened? Well, the Local Food Coalition started um, maybe half a dozen years ago, or maybe uh, the seeds of it were, were sown a few years ago with um, one of our community members attending a conference about local food systems and fostering the economic development, the support of local farmers, um, the eating of healthier foods that were locally grown, unprocessed foods. And this community member came back and, and set a meeting date, uh, inviting people to come and talk about lo local foods. And 60 people showed up at that meeting. And so. 60? Yeah. So well, we knew. That, that wasn't we, exactly what you expected, right? Right. We were thinking maybe a dozen, 20 people maybe would show uh -huh. up. And so okay. we knew we were onto something and, and uh, was really striking um, uh, a chord with a lot of people in the community. And so we've been meeting monthly ever since to talk about local food issues. And uh, a few years later, we organized ourselves into a legal entity, a 501c3 nonprofit, so that we could um, apply for some different kinds of funding sources to support the programming that has expanded to include things like uh, cooking and nutrition classes and the mobile kitchen at the farmer's market and a bunch of different programming related to, to that. But um, that's sort of a little bit about the, the history of, of where we came from. And now we're at a moment where we're moving forward with other big projects mm -hmm. that uh, that we're developing and and uh, clarifying our values and our mission and our role in the community and what kinds of things we'd like to see happen in the future. I think this would be a really good time to tell people what is the mission of yeah. the Local Food Coalition. Well, the mission of the San Luis Valley Local Foods Coalition is to foster an equitable local food system that restores the health of the people, community, economy, and ecosystem. Aha! Uh -huh. Excellent, excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just add right now that I've been so impressed learning about just a teensy tiny bit about health and food and nutrition in the San Luis Valley that I'm going to be dedicating our programs over the rest of the spring and the summer. So we're going to learn a lot about local food and how to stay healthy and how to cook some of this stuff. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, Karen. Now, tell me a bit about the programs of the Local Food Coalition. Sure. So there are um, two big projects that we're presently working on. We have a healthy living park um, that we're in the process of developing. It's 38 acres at the uh, along the Rio Grande River. It's at the intersection of Highway 17 and Highway 160 in Alamosa. And um, we are engaged in an 18-month planning process with um, uh, landscape architects and, and designers, developers, uh, par partners through the Trust for Public Lands. And uh, we've met with the county commissioners and city council, and we've had about 150 different people give input on the process at the, at the community process meetings that we've held throughout the fall. And we're just about to begin a second round of those meetings because the initial ideas that we collected at that first round of meetings have now been sketched out into some um, uh, architectural drawings that people can look at and vote on and decide mm -hmm. how we want our, our park to look. So that's um, that's one, one big project that the Local Foods Coalition is engaged in. Another one is the Food Hub. And the food hub is uh, called Valley Roots, and it's um, located in Moscow. And, and maybe some of your listeners aren't familiar what, with what a food hub is, but a food hub provides the infrastructure. It's, it's a physical place that provides the infrastructure for local producers, farmers, people who, who uh, grow food, ranchers, farmers, to sell directly to wholesale their food to a local distributor rather than having to go through um, a national distributor and so uh, a food hub aggregates these crops um, whether they're meats and cheeses or vegetables or fruits 
in a, uh, a facility that's a USDA certified facility with appropriate refrigeration and the food safety checks all along the way. And then that um, central location is a place that f people who purchase food wholesale, or what wholesale whether they are um, restaurants or uh, food service directors for the hospital or for different schools or for different different entities that that are used to buying food wholesale they don't have to uh, try to find as many carrots as they need from all the mm -hmm. individual farmers in the neighborhood they know that they can go to one place and get carrots that are aggregated from from several different farmers and the other nice thing about these food hubs and and we have one here there's one in the Arkansas Valley there's one in um, I mean there are several that are that are sprouting up in this interconnected network of food hubs and food nodes is that we can develop regional food systems that um, mean that we are um, having Colorado proud food that we can sell to Denver and buy from Denver and get from Durango and get from Salida and get from um, sort of our regional partners and and another I think important piece about the the uh, the infrastructure of food hubs is that it gives us some sense of food security. Uh -huh. If there are some problems with the the other systems that we uh, that we use to get food, which sometimes our food comes from several thousand miles away, mm -hmm. um, it's nice to have food that is locally produced, and and we can uh, um, we can be assured of its safety. We can be assured of. Um, knowing the people who grow our food and, and the kinds of food safety issues that are important to us. I think there's also the issue of supporting the local economy. Absolutely. And uh, supporting your neighbors down the road. Mm -hmm. And of course, since we're very rural here, there are people that produce it all down the road from us. Absolutely. You know, Karen, I was asking you about the challenges that in, in terms of the local food coalition. Tell me about that. Well, um, I, I'm, I'm reframing that as the challenges that we have as eaters of food uh -huh. um, and and the challenges that caused us to form that local food co this local food coalition and um, what I see is that some of the challenges are that we're we're resisting this corporatized food system that is producing the these high calorie low nutrient, food-like substances that are actually ne bad for our health. They don't mm -hmm. have any cultural relevance. They aren't designed for nutrition or for health. They're designed for profitability and shelf stability. Um, they are, in fact, making us sick. We are, are sicker than we've ever been. We have all sorts of diet-related diseases. We have diabetes. We have um, heart disease and um, all, all sorts of diseases that are reversible through getting back in touch with a diet that is more authentic to our cultural heritage. There is nothing um, particularly American about an American diet other than that mm. it's bad for us. I mean, you mentioned SAD. Yes, yes. Tell um, me about that. The SAD is an acronym for the Standard American Diet. Mm -hmm. And um, all across the globe, when th foods of the standard American diet are introduced to indigenous people, they develop problems with diabetes, with heart disease, with obesity, with all these diet-related um, problems. So indeed, the standard American diet is sad. Mm -hmm. Also, I, I learned something, and this is an aside that I'm going to sneak in, mm -hmm. and that is, ladies and gentlemen, look on the back of bottles of things that you buy like ketchup and you'll see that there's certain things in there that are measured as a percentage of what you need daily to eat with the exception of sugar and there's an awful lot of sugar in our foods that mm -hmm. kind of sneaks in there absolutely part of the standard american diet mm -hmm. so it might be the sneaky american diet <laughs> that, that we talk be. about Okay, since we're talking about uh, the Local Food Coalition, where's the website? What is it? The website is slvlocalfoods.org. Excellent. Okay. And there is an office, but the best place to get information about it is from the website. Mm -hmm. And also the website lists things that are happening or going to happen. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yep. And in fact, um, on 
April 18th, uh, next Saturday, there will be a uh, work day at the Healthy Living Park. All are invited to come and help with um, getting the garden beds ready for the coming season and we'll be doing some fence building and sign building and um, getting things ready with some spring cleaning. And, then and I hear there's a, a rumor that some yummy things are going to be available. I would be surprised uh, if we didn't have delicious food at a local foods event. <laughs> we tend Excellent. to always Excellent. do that. Yeah. Now there's one thing that's going on with planting right now, but and that is the Guatemalan farmers? That's correct. So the um, the property of the Rio Grande Healthy Living Park is under this, as I mentioned, this 18-month process of developing the gr the grand plan of what will will uh, that design of the park will be and the different elements and where they're going to be. But we certainly want it to be used in the in the time being, um, and we want it to. But we also need to develop the longer-term process of how to um, manage the people the. Uh, the system for people to use that land and mm -hmm. so in the in the past few years the Guatemalan families have been using that land to grow food and while we are continuing to develop the process for the 2016 season for individuals in our community to families in our community to sign up to have access to a plot um, those same Guatemalan families will continue to grow on it for the 2015 season so stay tuned for next year in 2016 when we'll have a big campaign for how um, people can get involved and access a plot to grow their own food. Excellent, excellent. Okay, well now um, tell me about, you have cooking classes, you have nutrition program, and just recently you had a very special cooking class. That's right. Um, uh, earlier in April we had um, Francis uh, van der Schreppen at the uh, the the chef at Milagro's taught uh, cooking and nutrition classes uh, to some Adams State students. And college students are actually a nutritionally vulnerable population. They have, um, they're economically vulnerable. A lot of the times they don't have a lot of money. Um, but they're also at a stage in their life where they may not have access to a full kitchen or, or have the, the tools, the cooking tools, or have the know-how of how to cook nutritionally for themselves. So I've certainly talked to college students who are living on ramen and cliff bars because they don't know how else to cook what for themselves. What is a cliff bar? A cliff bar is like a, a little granola bar that uh, that ah. you can buy at the grocery store. And, and while that can sustain life, that's not, a, a lot of those are, are high calorie camping foods. Um, and uh, and there isn't a lot of variety there and there's some sugar there. And so talking with that particular student, it, inspired me to work with Francis to put these cooking classes together. And so um, these cooking classes cover um, basics, cooking basics, and how to eat uh, eat well on a budget. And the first class was fantastic. We started with, um, uh, she had a handout that included what a basic pantry ought to have. And she is even offering to help the students outfit their pantries with the basic needs that they uh, that w they'd need just getting started out and then she cooked about a half a dozen fantastic easy nutritious recipes economical recipes that were three or four or five calories um, or three or four or five uh, ingredients to make these healthy nutritious foods and within an hour she had made five different entrees okay um, ladies and gentlemen you Italian restaurants ought to watch out. Talk to me about the Alfredo sauce. Oh, exactly. Yeah, that's an excellent example. So an Alfredo sauce is not a particularly complicated recipe. It's milk, and, and uh, she made it with cornstarch so it could be gluten-free. And um, we added all sorts of um, other favorite elements to it. But she shared the example of how... Um, if you go to an Italian restaurant, you'd pay upwards of $10 for... Uh, an entree, an Alfredo sauce entree, where for that same ten dollars you could buy all of the ingredients to make enough Alfredo for a you know a, a whole dinner party worth of people. The people so in your dormitory. The people wait, in wait. your dormitory, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And did so, it take a long time? No, not not at all. It took. I mean, all 
she made, like I said, maybe five, six different recipes in the course of an hour. So uh-huh. they all were 10 or 15 minutes each. It was quite remarkable and very delicious. And you can imagine college students are generally ravenous people, and they were full. And there was so much food that we were t- we took home uh, take home containers as well. So that uh-huh. that was really positive as well. So then this food can be healthy. It can be um, fun to make. It can serve your friends, and it can be economical. That's right. What what more could we ask for, ladies right. and gentlemen? Right. And okay. So there's a there's a possibility of more uh, cooking classes in the future. So ladies and gentlemen, you got to tune in on the second and fourth Fridays because we're going to bring you lots of good stuff about what's happening in, in the future and also how you can get involved. Now, are you looking for volunteers for things? Well, absolutely, and and I, I mentioned the April 18th at 9 a.m. workday is uh, is a great way to get involved and, and meet some of your neighbors who are working at the Healthy Living Park um, that day for our Spring Cleaning Earth Day event. Um, there are all sorts of volunteer opportunities for teaching cooking classes, being uh-huh. an assistant teacher, uh-huh. um, and you can find out more about that at the slvlocalfoods.org website as well. Um, there are opportunities to... Um, to uh, to purchase and consume local foods. I think that's sort of the the starting point, I think, is to help people be educated on how to cook mm-hmm. with fresh fruits and vegetables, um, local local meats, local flour, local local foods, um, and um, and how to access those foods. So I think uh, one of my another goal that I'm interested in, or, or I see the local foods working towards is developing the infrastructure like the food hub that supports people meeting their neighbors, meeting the people who are growing food or are doing what is called value added um, changes to food so that they they're selling a product that is um, a, is a locally processed food. So for example, um, people who buy local flour and then they bake scones and they sell the scones. Mm-hmm. Well we have the we have the ability to provide the um, food safety classes so that all of the food is in compliance with USDA regulations for food safety, um, helping people access a commercial kitchen so that they're preparing the food in a, in a safe environment, packaging it and refrigerating it and, and doing the things that need to be done safely, and then selling that food in its value-added state, being a scone rather than being um, a bag of flour. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it's exciting the opportunities for people as consumers of food, um, but it's also an economic driver for people to be producers of either either growing food or producing these value-added products as well. I think there's also the idea that people can be entrepreneurs and Absolutely. so that they can work on their own independence, their own economic mm-hmm. viability, and they can have fun. Mm-hmm. And that's great. Now, you mentioned to me something about one local food every day. What's yeah, I, I really challenge myself to try to eat at least one food every day that, um, that, came, that was grown in the San Luis Valley. And it may, might be easier than you than you think, um, and especially if you have some food preservation skills, which we also teach workshops on how to preserve food, how to do canning, how to do fermentation, how to um, some some are maybe self-explanatory, but I, I hate to assume that things are self-explanatory. They wouldn't be self-explanatory to me. How Karen. to freeze? But so, for example, in the in autumn, what I like to do is go to the farmer's market and buy a big thing of uh, roasted chilies, green chilies, and then I seed them and take the skins off and I freeze them and then that is part of my, if I make soups with that or, or I have those green chilies to add to eggs or, or whatnot, then I that's part of the one little local food that I can eat in a day. Um, if I, I know people who have chickens and 
Um, I buy eggs directly from them, and if I have one of their eggs, that's one local food that I can eat that day. Well, you just knocked um, off two things I in one day. Very things. good, absolutely. Um, in, you mentioned something that's going to be happening in the pretty near future, and that's the beginning of the farmer's market here in Alamosa. Mm-hmm, this summer. And um, we will be having some interviews with people who go to and provide food at the farmer's market. And they also have great philosophies of growing stuff. And we're going to have one interview, and you're going to have to pay attention, ladies and gentlemen, out in the field with the people that plant the food and bring it up. Excellent. It's coming up. It's coming down in the future. So... In terms of the advantages to people who live in the San Luis Valley of eating local foods, let's revisit that because yes. it kind of gets lost in the deal, okay? Absolutely. And um, we, uh, a few years ago, hired a consultant to do a study. We've done a couple of studies. The San Luis Valley Local Foods Coalition did a, in partnership with the um, Prevention Research Group, a study of how who is producing local foods in in the region. There are sixty some local farmers who sell directly to consumers in the San Luis Valley, and it's important to um, know who those people are and be able to provide that infrastructure to get, connect with them. Um, we also did a study or commissioned a study that looked at the impact, the economic impact of food that is consumed, or or, excuse me, food that is, food dollars that are kept in the San Luis Valley. Is there any information that people can find, a current list of that? Yes, absolutely. Um, We produce a local food guide Uh that has uh, all of the producers in the San Luis Valley listed in that food guide with all of their contact information. And this summer we'll be coming out with the 2015 local food guide. Ah, wonderful. And will your website tell us how we can get that? Yes, you can also go to slvlocalfoods.org and you can find that listing of local producers there as well. Excellent. And not all of them come to the Alamosa um, food uh, farmers um, market. That's correct. Some of them um, don't make the don't make the trip, but you can either contact them directly. You could work through a community supported agriculture a CSA. Um, and as the food hub is uh, getting ready to come online later this summer, we'll also be able to have those products available there as well. Excellent, excellent. Do you like to cook? I do. Oh, wonderful. Okay, I live an hour and a half away from Alamosa, Mm -hmm. and I have learned that you have to cook to survive, and so I've made some progress, but I'm looking forward to what we're going to be learning this summer, ladies and gentlemen, about where to cook, where to buy, how to do it, and all those great things. So keep staying tuned. So, Karen... Do you think that local foods can do anything to improve the condition of lives here in the San Luis Valley? Oh, yes. I think it's it's an extremely important economic driver for um, entrepreneurial opportunities to create meaningful jobs that have a living wage. Um, and I think it, it's, again, driven by both producing and consuming. We need people to who are willing to consume and pay for local mm-hmm. foods that create the market for the local producers to take the risk of growing the food that's mm-hmm. going to be in demand here. Um, but it's a, a virtuous cycle of us um, supporting our local farmers by buying the food from them and uh, and the interaction that occurs neighbor to neighbor when farmers know what the consumers want. If we prefer a certain kind of vegetable to be grown or a certain variety of tomato or a certain kind of herb, um, next season they'll be sure to grow that for Uh us because we we create that demand. And I think there's a fallacy about eating locally is way more expensive than buying the standard American diet things. And if you look at the advantage of buying fresh food cooking fresh food and eating things that encourage you to be healthy and happy, Mm -hmm. that's not very expensive. 
Yeah, it's expensive in different ways. It's expensive maybe in time. Um, mm-hmm. But as I pointed out, the recipes that Francis shared the other night, they were 10 or 15 minutes. They they, they weren't a lot of time, but there is some on uh, on ramping of the knowledge and skills. You may have to invest time in learning how to, to cook these things if you didn't learn them from a parent or a grandparent. Um, there are also costs related to health. It may be inexpensive to get a 99 cent hamburger from a mm-hmm. fast food chain, but it has um, a long-term negative health con- cost uh, associated with it. But I, I, I truly believe, and and I, and I, as I mentioned earlier, I strive to do a very, a, a radically local food diet. Um, I, I truly believe that buying fruit that's in season and preserving it and being able to eat it throughout the year is much more economical than me going to the grocery store and buying a small bag of frozen fruit that um, that someone else had the convenience. I'm paying for the convenience of someone else freezing it during the time of year. And it also me. may have come from 2,000 miles away or even come, farther away. Exactly. Okay, let's, we're getting close to the end of our show. Let's revisit the website and also talk a little bit about volunteer act opportunities. Yes, so um, the website for the San Luis Valley Local Foods Coalition is SLV localfoods.org mm-hmm. and in terms of and, and at that website you can find out about some of the volunteer opportunities coming up including the April 18th work day at the Healthy Living Park which is on the corner of Highway 17 and Highway 160 it's on Saturday April 18th starting at 9 a.m. there will be um, delicious snacks available um, throughout the day and we'll be doing things like getting the garden bre- beds prepped building some fencing um, building some signage, cleaning up the area, doing some spring cleaning. Mm-hmm. So if you play your cards right, ladies and gentlemen, you might even get a ride on a tractor. <laughs> that, that may be possible, yeah. Yes, but you need to bring your own, what are those things, tools or what What kind of? Oh, we'll have tools. We'll have all, yeah. I mean, just bring bring maybe a water bottle and a sun hat. And if you've got some gloves, but we, uh, we'll, we'll even provide gloves there as well. If you just um, bring your community spirit and your interest in um, healthy food and, and getting your hands in the earth. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been speaking with Karen Lemke, who is the president and one of the founders of the San Luis Valley Local Food Coalition and the first person that we've talked with in terms of the exciting things we're going to hear about food and nutrition and what's happening in our beautiful San Luis Valley. Thank you again for tuning in into the uh, San Luis Valley Community Roundtable, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Bye now.